Yeah? yeah? Right? Yes. Yeah. Deal? Boing. Welcome to the Acquia Podcast, Drupal Technology, Community and Business. Welcome to the Acquia Podcast, Drupal Technology, Community and Business. module for that? There, of course there is. So I haven't recorded one of these in a while. This is a fresh new session from Jam's virtual Drupal camp, uh, which is a piece of the Acquia podcast. This is a part of the podcast where I find things that have come out that uh, sound interesting or important going on in the Drupal community, people presenting sessions around the world uh, that I'd like to um, have findable. I'd like to make sure that our community can uh, can uh, get a hold of those uh, now and in the future. So, in that vein, Brad Cerniak, welcome to my Drupal Camp. How are you today? Thanks. Thanks for having me. Uh, I'm doing great. Yourself? I'm going to hand this over to you to present your session about the um, development uh, principles that you follow and, and where you work and how you know they sort of function well at a hackathon because it's all about, you know, design, uh, efficiency, folding up code, right, using features and, and all of that stuff. So uh, sound good? Sounds great. Brad, you work at a Drupal shop called, well, you work at a development shop called Commercial Progression. Is that a Drupal only shop or, or what do you, what do you uh, good folks do? Yes, that is a, a Commercial Progression is a, a Drupal only shop. Uh, uh, right here in Northville, Michigan, and we work with clients of all sizes, uh, picking up uh, uh, either inheriting clients from uh, previous developers because uh, we're pretty well known for uh, prompt and friendly service, um, and then uh, brand new site builds uh, ranging in all different sorts of sizes, and they're all built on Drupal. I am going to hand this over to you now. Um, so you should share your screen, pull up your slides, and um, ah, I suppose the one thing I should say is that uh, so the stuff that Drupal brings to the table as far as rapid development and and bringing uh, you know becoming a healthy minimum viable product uh, that helped Brad in a hackathon make a really useful. Uh, application. Brad's going to talk about some development principles and some ways that he and his colleagues <clears throat> at commercial progression see and use Drupal. Some tips about like do all these things and avoid all these other things. And that all sort of came uh, from our conversation about how the, the, the hackathon was a success in, in technical terms. And so he's going to share with us principles about working with Drupal. Brad, over to you and your session. Great, thank you very much. I'm sharing it right now. Uh, let's confirm that it's running. All right, uh, it should be up on the screen. I can see it, and it's beautiful. <laughs> I love it. I'm going to, uh, may, may I steal that? Sure, I'll send you the images themselves. Awesome, um, fantastic. All right, well, thank you for having me for uh, uh, this podcast, Drupal Camp. I, I'll dive right into some of the things that we've got here. So first off, I'm Brad. Uh, we covered that in the interview part. Uh, I work for Commercial Progression, and we do Drupal-based websites in Michigan. And yes, we work uh, exclusively with Drupal. It's great, uh, and we uh, we probably have a combined 15, 20 years of of Drupal experience uh, sitting in our office right now. So um, going back to Drupal five, and that combined experience has uh, shaped the way that all of us work. So. Uh, if you're familiar with Occam's razor um, in the movie Contact, uh, the simplest answer is usually correct. 
And that's actually an oversimplification of Occam's razor. But uh, one thing to note here is that um, it's not always true. Uh, I think that Albert Einstein actually uh, uh, added the correct caveat here. So everything should be made as simple as possible, but no simpler. And uh, how this plays into Drupal development is similar to how it plays out in all kinds of development and in daily life. It may not always be true, for instance, um, in cooking, a very complex recipe may be much better than a very simple one. At the same time, the converse can be true as well. So um, uh, in development, generally, having less code to do a particular thing uh, is going to play out for a whole bunch of different reasons. And uh, targeting the simplest base to get the job that you want to get done uh, is advantageous across the board. So if we look at this from a Drupal perspective, and so much of Drupal comes down to entities and uh, how they're fieldable, and it's not in this, uh, in this little drawing here, but um, along with fields, there are properties, in, at least in, in D7. So uh, when it comes to fields, uh, you have the form side of things, which would be widgets, and the display side of things, which are formatters. So if you have something that you're writing, and I'm sorry, th th these may seem like overly obvious um, kind of truisms, and, that, uh, and you, you may already be thinking in, the, in these ways if you're a Drupal developer and listening to this, this camp session. Uh, what I found is that uh, oftentimes taking a breather, going and sitting down in a chair, I'm, I suddenly realize that I'm thinking of something way more complex than I have to, and so I kind of dumb myself down. And so probably the best advice from, the whole, from this whole session is um, let yourself dumb things down. Uh, and so from uh, an entity perspective, if you're looking at Wait, something so Brad, and you're like, Brad, sure. but I, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt, but does that mean that things need to be as stupid as possible, but no stupider? <laughs> um, perhaps, uh, perhaps dumb wasn't the, the right word. Uh, I guess, I, I, I guess simple and, and dumb are not the same thing. Uh, so um, I guess taking a breather can help simplify things, but not make them dumber. <laughs> OK, I apologize for interrupting, but I had to get that one in. <laughs> sure. Uh, so uh, a lot of times, if uh, the first pass says, well, maybe I'm going to go into uh, the node view, like hook node view, or, or um, something at the node level. Um, oftentimes, that means that it might be uh, correct to do it at the field level, at the field attach level, um, or with the formatter itself. Uh, and I'll, I'm sort of glossing over view modes, and I'm not sure that I'm going to get back to them in any substan substantive way. But um, I find that they're really great. and um, so in times when you're going to be displaying an entity somewhere else, like in views, um, uh, of, often um, kind of modeling out what the content is and where it's being displayed uh, takes it beyond the page and default uh, and teaser uh, that you get out of the box. And luckily, it's really easy to add view modes from either code or using DS or um, as a entity view mode module that that does it real nice. So, um, so the idea would be kind of a bottom up uh, when it comes to entities, starting at the formatter and then the field um, itself, uh, and then finally, if you have to do it at the entity level, that would be um, the last option um, at when when you're looking at just an entity on its on its own. And so this translates into views, too. Um, typically, since views is dealing with mostly entity uh, data that's being pulled in, if you can take care of uh, what you need to do before you hit the view, 
that's going to probably save you some heartache. Uh, but since views uh, dictates the way that an interface works, especially with exposed filters and things like that, uh, sometimes you have to do it at the views level. And when you do, uh, rather than using the uh, execute and uh, display hooks and the query hooks that um, go pre and post, uh, a lot of times doing it at the level that you're uh, that you're working with uh, can segment your code in a way and uh, make it easier to find what it is that you were working on um, if you have to go back in or if you're picking up somebody else's code. So um, once again, it would be another uh, bottom-up principle when it comes to views. And then uh, I'm going to go off on a wild tangent in the next few slides. So. This is the, the buildup for it. When it comes to rendering, there are a whole bunch of different um, ways that things go down. And this is an incredible oversimplification of that. Um, but uh, the same as with if you're trying to do something and your first thought is do it with an entity. If, if your first thought is to do it at the page level, chances are that's not uh, necessary and it could cause performance issues. So um, typically you wouldn't uh, hook into a region, but maybe you'd hook into a block. Um, and blocks, they hold stuff and they can hold forms and uh, uh, views and entities and uh, all manner of things. So the overwhelming preference is to get to that stuff before it becomes a block because because oftentimes a block hold already holds rendered uh, content before you, when you get to it, when you alter it. So um, getting to whatever that stuff is is important. But the great thing about it is you can have a site that's all blocks, and all those blocks are holding stuff. And that's why I heart Blockify. The Blockify module takes the common site elements, so uh, site name, page title, breadcrumbs, tabs, actions, uh, all the things that you would find in your page.tpl.php, uh, it takes those out of the templates and puts them into blocks so you can place them using the core block UI. I cannot recommend Blockify enough. And even though this slide looks uh, kind of dirty, uh, what Blackify allows you to do is make your page.tpl uh, look very clean. So I tend, to get, I tend to be very hesitant about putting anything in the, in the page template that isn't a declaration of a region. Uh, maybe like one wrapper div or something like that. But for the most part, it's just uh, region declarations in my page. And I love that. I think it's really cool. So we have sort of a, a mantra in our office. And you can find it all over the place. And sometimes we walk in, and it's written somewhere new. So I've got a few pictures here for you. Um, everything's a block. Uh, that's my personal monitor. So every time I look up, I see that. Um, and then it's behind my coworker, Chris, there. Um, and obviously, everything isn't a block. So it's kind of uh, terrible that that is a statement that we claim to be true. But at a uh, placement level, at a um, at a level of thinking, how to implement something, it's really helpful. So we we have like we had a client that uh, sells industrial machinery, and they had a a way to search for the front end user to uh, to find equipment by category, and uh, the top area uh, instead of trying to inject the category information on each page, like on a, a taxonomy term page, uh, we implemented that as a block. And it allows 
uh, very flexible placement. Uh, we can reorder it and put it in a new place without um, having to really dig into um, even views. So uh, no code changes, no template changes, just, hey, that's a block. I know how to deal with blocks. And that's, uh, that's what it comes down to. So um, uh, probably talked way too much about blocks already. So I'll be moving on and probably revisiting that. So uh, rather than kind of walk through um, a set process that we have, and uh, I'm sure uh, wherever you work that you have a process in place and that it works uh, to your organization's needs, uh, rather than uh, just walking through what we do and how we do it, uh, I kind of formulated this into some guidelines um, and made them as clear as possible by um, going with do's and don'ts. And I figured we start with the don'ts because they're always more fun. Uh, in a lot of cases, these don'ts come from the projects where we inherit code from, from uh, other developers, or um, realistically, it's also from mistakes that we've made uh, on uh, past sites. So um, the very first and foremost one is don't pee HP in your database. And uh, I can't emphasize this enough. It's it's probably the uh, uh, probably just like the biggest frustration is uh, trying to track down where the heck something is coming from. Um, and it's doubly frustrating. Um, just the idea of uh, turning on PHP filter or views PHP or something like that, that it's it's like admitting that, you, that you're that um, you not willing to figure out what the right way to do it was in the first place. So um, a lot of the other don'ts on this list aren't like, don't like hurt my heart, but uh, finding PHP in the database is a, it's a sad Brad moment. Okay, so the same uh, general principle as don't put in PHP in the database is um, making sure to continue to separate content from behavior from presentation. Um, and so contemplate was, was more of a uh, uh, D6, uh, was more popular in, in, in that time. Um, but like even, uh, the fences module, which is really cool, and it does have applications. Um, I'm not going to say don't ever use it, uh, uh, especially if you're getting into SEO territory. Uh, but the the idea would be if you can't find why something is happening or where it's happening uh, quickly and be able to override it or have somebody else come into a project and, and, and be able to understand it quickly, uh, these are these are two modules. These are two approaches to uh, uh, building out displays that can um, that can be confusing and problematic. Um, and along with that is panels, um, and it's another one like fences, where of course there are reasons to install panels, but there are people who install panels on day one without having a clear reason of why, and then. Uh, when somebody else goes in to try to figure out what's going on, um, there's a lot of clicking. There's overriding of core UI that can be very frustrating. So um, this one's something that we kind of joke about internally quite a bit. It's like, uh, oh, we're getting a project. I wonder if it'll use panels. Um, a couple of other modules that go along um, with panels as um, possible day one installs that um, may or may not cause that kind of trouble. Um, display suite uh, and context, both great modules, um, both give you a lot of power. Uh, but if if an entire site is built that way, it can it can it can cause trouble. So the the principle of simplicity, going back to Occam's razor and Einstein's razor. Um, uh, 
you wouldn't want to like shoot yourself in the foot. So simplicity wise, um, uh, just trying to pick the right modules off the bat is a um, and minimize the number that you have to use is good. So probably one of the more fun things that, that I found in a, in a project that I inherited was um, views within views within views. And it's a, it's a major performance concern. And uh, there's a lot of configuration that goes on in making sure that you know where things are coming from. I'm not going to go too deep into this, but um, like views field view is, uh, it has a very narrow use case. <laughs> So um, as with two slides ago, um, uh, by picking just the modules that you need and picking ones that are um, going to be reliable for you, you're promoting that simplicity. So when I go and look at a module I haven't used before, um, uh, just from the Drupal.org slash project slash whatever page. Um, look at the number of installs. Um, uh, look at the top and the right hand side. Uh, how many maintainers are on it? When was the last time they committed? How many commits do they have? Um, now look in the issue queue um, and see sort of ratios, see um, whether there's activity going on there. Uh, and then looking at the um, repository view on the right hand side, I like to do a quick check and see if the commits match up to issue numbers, because that's usually a good sign. Um, and then even taking a look at the code itself and seeing what the what it's doing um, can be really helpful when it comes to reviewing modules. So if you're trying to minimize the number, having redundant modules is going to uh, obviously be a, um, a deterrent for, to the simplicity. So uh, do you really need more than one um, modal library or slideshow or something of, of that nature? Um, can C tools take you a certain distance before you have to uh, use an external library in the first place? Um, so those are the sort of questions. And typically, if you're installing a second slideshow uh, module, it's um, an indication that there's uh, a lack of design consistency as well. Uh, repeat this quite a bit. Don't hack core. Um, I'm sure you've all heard it before. Um, and then uh, along the same lines, hacking a contrib module is going to uh, can cause you the same sort sort of trouble. So we had a client that had uh, quick tabs, and they had a custom quick tab style, and they put it in uh, the module directory. So when we went and ran um, uh, update, um, on, did a code update, that all got wiped out. So now those quick tab styles were gone, and we had to go back through the uh, uh, get commit history and, and grab that and then put it into a separate place. So um, really doing anything in those contrib uh, uh, folders can cause you trouble when it comes to main, uh, maintainability. All right, don't litter. Um, if you're done with a file, delete it, and it'll be in the commit history. Uh, I guess sort of one of one mindset that that I have when it comes to to developing is uh, somebody else is going to see this at this code at some point, and when they do, I don't want them to be mad at me. So, um, like putting you know dot legacy at the end of a file and and just leaving it there instead of deleting it and letting the uh, revision history take care of it. Uh, that's the sort of thing where I, I, I would be ashamed of myself. Um, so yeah, don't litter. Uh, in the same way that if you're in a inside of a file, um, commenting out code or leaving um, 
like whole blocks of a of a file commented out um, is more or less the same as having a completely separate file uh, just staying there. So um, use Git for what it's intended for and keep everything as clean as possible. Uh, the the Drupal community coding standards, which can be checked with uh, the coder module and coder tough love, uh, they're there for a purpose. They make it easier to uh, uh, get up to speed on a particular project or, or diagnose problems. And uh, a lot of IDEs will help you do this right off the bat. So uh, uh, there's really no excuse not to indent things properly and use proper spacing and things like that. So um, I highly encourage that. Uh, so a sort of formidable code smell that you, you can find pretty quickly in a theme is if you look in the templates directory and there's more than one or maybe two page templates and um, all the nodes are broken out by type. Um, usually that means uh, from a node standpoint that the um, uh, field UI isn't going to be very useful for uh, managing the display. And from a page perspective, uh, any change that you make in one page template, you, you're more, more or less likely going to have to do from two, three, as many page templates as there are. So uh, if you can implement it without doing that, all the better. And then, especially when it comes to just plain markup, uh, don't hard code anything that's more than a line. Um, render arrays can be just as much of a pain, and templates aren't very easy to implement, but they often uh, will pay off down the, down the road. So moving away from the negative and going into the positive, um, these are things, helpful tips that uh, we've picked up along the way and share with each other at our weekly uh, dev meetings. So first, uh, and uh, fortunately, Drush will, uh, will respect this, is if you're in sites all modules, um, if you open that up, uh, for any of our projects that are going to be three folders in there, contrib, custom, and features. And contrib just holds contrib modules. Custom is uh, stuff that we wrote. Um, and then features is automatically generated from the features module. So um, it's a really easy way to segment um, uh, different types of modules. Um, and if you're trying to get up to speed on what's uh, custom on a particular site, it's easy enough to go in and, and, and open one folder and see that stuff. Uh, so this is one that kind of bit me at um, on our recent project was uh, we had a, a client that wanted uh, prices and it wasn't a commerce project. It was, it was a, a, but they still wanted to have price fields. And I implemented that as a number, it was a decimal. And um, then we go into a meeting and they're like, well, we want to know, we want to be able to specify which currency it is. And so if I had spent just a few more minutes right off the bat saying, um, rather than be a decimal field, this should be a commerce price field, um, then I would have benefited from uh, the community right off the bat and wouldn't have had to uh, re-import all the data on the staging site. So, um, uh, yeah, whenever you're uh, trying to figure out what a, a field does, um, yeah, so price is a good example, addresses, um, things of that nature. Uh, having that right from day one can save you a lot of time. Uh, I mentioned Blockify before. Just just do it. <laughs> and. Uh, and feel the benefit in your page uh, template file and um, uh, when you have to set visibility on something. 
Um, so here are a few easy win modules that are in our internal install profile. Um, global redirect, path auto, honeypot, chosen, and elements. Um, these are ones you can turn on and they, and they work. Uh, and even the defaults tend to be exactly what they should be. So configuration is, is minimal. Um, and keep a list of the one of the modules that you use on all projects and just be able to drop them into the next one or make your own um, install profile. Um, so this one played into the hackathon. Uh, so if you can get something done entirely with Contrib um, with well-established modules, that's a that's the best way to go. Uh, you're not relying on uh, code that you have to test or untested code. You're doing things the way that the rest of the community uh, uh, has agreed to do them. So um, if you can get you know ninety five percent of the way on a project uh, without writing any code at all, that's great. So uh, yeah, let Contrib lead the way. So this is for your, on your laptop. Um, I've never installed SendMail on my local machine um, because I don't want to send out a whole bunch of uh, emails to uh, who knows accidentally. So if you need to test email, if you're using like mail system and my mail and all those things in conjunction, um, the SMTP uh, module will let you actually send emails, and the reroute email module will make sure that they only go to one person. So if you accidentally do send off some mass mailing, um, it's just going to fill your inbox rather than um, sending individual messages to thousands of people. Um, when it comes time to write custom code, we have a glue module um, that we just drop in every project that already contains uh, useful stuff. But if it comes time to extend uh, a particular field to have a special field format or, uh, or do something like a, um, a views argument uh, a plugin or, or something of that nature, uh, starting that off as a, as a reusable a module and then creating your own repo for it and then potentially turning it into something that's that that becomes contrib um, that's a lot of what Drupal's about so um, kind of just asking yourself the question how can I make this general how can I make this generic and, and reusable um, can can save time on the next project so like I said we have a drop-in glue code module so it's compro underscore custom and uh, so without having to uh, create, you know, spend that 45 seconds to create a .info and a .module file with the name of the project or whatever you would call that module, um, this is something you can just drop right in. So we have that for um, the glue code module. We have it for compro underscore add minimal, and we have it compro underscore tau. Um, so our sub themes that we would use site to site can just be dropped in and then modified. So one thing that the glue code module does um, out of the box is there's a very simple menu callback in there. And um, uh, the callback just says return, and it's a single space string. And so you can set the front to um, slash blank. And um, in doing so, the entire front page can be built as blocks. Um, whether or not you have content um, to go with it. If you have a particular view, um, that's probably a better way to go. But with a lot of front pages, it seems like there's uh, tons of custom things going on and it's very uh, block centric often. So uh, the front, the blank page callback uh, comes in handy. So one part of uh, 
saving some heartache is where you would put theming functions, especially theme overrides. And the examples in the next slide, uh, but the two options would be um, uh, altering the theme registry and then writing a theme function in a module or uh, writing uh, theme underscore in a uh, uh, template.php. So uh, this example, make buttons into buttons, is sort of an exercise for the listener. Uh, oh, I had implemented this as uh, a registry alter in a module. And what ended up happening was that my admin theme was not happy about all of my inputs turning into buttons. Um, so moving it into the template.php as a theming function for button um, uh, saved some trouble when I want, wanted to go to manage display and click the little gears. Um, but the reason to make buttons into buttons in the first place is uh, when you have an iOS device specifically, uh, uh, styling inputs with CSS can um, have some really unintended consequences, whereas buttons reliably take their CSS. So uh, one fun practice, uh, because often uh, we'll spend hours in views clicking checkboxes, reordering um, fields, uh, things of that, of that nature, is if you have a preference for view modes and manage display in the uh, core entity UIs, um, then you can render those entities and pick which view mode you want to use um, and then manage which things are going to show up for a particular entity on a particular row. This doesn't work so well for uh, table displays and views, but it works great for unformatted lists and things of that nature. So um, it's been something of a time saver, especially uh, for slideshows where it's an image plus additional content. Um, we can have multiple content types as long as they all have a field image. Um, uh, we can play around with what gets displayed uh, from the rendered entities rather than trying to um, have big jumbles of, uh, of fields. So one of the easy win modules I mentioned was chosen. It's a library from Atlassian. They make uh, Bitbucket and stuff like that. At least I believe they are the people who did this. Um, and chosen takes any select element, HTML select element, and makes it much easier to use. So you get search, um, multi-select is really easy. Um, it's just really nice. And uh, so along with that, avoid redundant modules um, concept is um, there are a whole bunch of different ways out there to um, to do multi-select on uh, field widgets. Chosen uh, is a way that you can introduce consistency because it just works. So let's say that you have a view and uh, this is a very specific test case, but uh, you want to put a tab onto a node. So it would be node slash star slash my thing here. And uh, you only want to show it to show up um, in very particular cases or for a particular content type. The way that you could do that is by um, specifying it in your in a in an access function for or a menu access function so um, if you do that uh, you're going to want to call the original access function and the way that you can do that is with uh, call user funk array and you can pass in uh, the original arguments uh, using this get the value back as the return and then uh, write a, a quick conditional to make sure that the original access function uh, passes as well as whatever additional access you're trying to um, uh, to figure out. So 
uh, in general, that's a, that's a good thing when it comes to overrides. And another function name slide. Uh, typically, if we have something that's not facing a user, it's probably an entity. And if it's something that is facing a user, then it's specifically a node. So um, with ECK entities, they're usually things that we're dealing with on the admin side. And for that reason, hook custom access paths, one of my favorite hooks, um, uh, makes it really easy to say, hey, make that use the admin theme instead of the uh, regular theme. Uh, this one's come back to bit me a couple of times, so I figure it's worth pointing out here. Um, the meta tag module, which for, for most purposes is an easy win. Um, if you have a view um, that has, for instance, an exposed uh, filter on it, um, if the page title is supposed to change based on the value of the exposed filter, uh, meta tag may prevent that because it caches uh, page titles. So uh, this is one place where uh, uh, you may have to manually clear the cache in code in order to get the page titles to play nice. And it's, it has never been fun. Uh, this, this one's kind of fun. Um, let's say you have an ECK entity and it doesn't need a title property um, or a field collection or pretty much any entity. Um, and even though it doesn't have a title property, you still have people who would be editing on it. Uh, in those circumstances, you can set a label callback uh, in the entity info and make the the title on the top of the page, the page title, uh, be whatever you want it to be. Um, and then that can be that title can be used uh, in views and other places where uh, you would ordinarily use it, uh, like a note title, for instance. So label callbacks are fun and can be very useful. Um, going back to the very first to don't, um, if, you th if you feel like you're about to um, implement something by putting PHP into your database. Um, tokens is often a good answer. Um, implementing tokens is, is one of the easier things to do. Um, and then using them in views and other places, uh, it's pretty straightforward and site builders can uh, benefit from it. So um, often that's like uh, doing additional string operations and in views. And then this is one I had thought of uh, uh, sort of recently is like if you have two fields and the display um, that you're looking for is based on those two fields, um, but it's just a single thing, uh, hook field extra fields is probably a good way to do it. If it's the value of only a single field that you're trying to display, then just a regular formatter on that field is probably the way to go. Um, one caveat with the extra fields is the markup for that for extra fields are different from regular ones. So if you want a label or things like that, then you may have to kind of fake it. And then this one is a, a big part of the hackathon and a way to do things pretty quickly once you get up to, once you have everything set up is, uh, so if you have an entity type and then you have a view that goes along with that entity type, uh, you can go into features, just select the, uh, the entity type and just select the view and it should pick up uh, the field bases, the field instances um, and all the dependencies that you need to go along with it. And so you don't need to manually rebuild it every time. Um, but one thing to be careful with field bases is whatever the first, uh, uh, usually a node that you uh, uh, build a feature out of, may try to take like the field body as a field base and roll that into the feature. And if you do that, then all your other features might depend on that, that feature. So um, it may be worthwhile to omit any core field bases 
from any of your features or to roll it into a separate feature on its own. All right, this is a quick one-liner, uh, and it's pretty much the reason that we have a in-house uh, admin sub-theme is this piece of CSS um, makes any uh, field in a, um, in a views display that is excluded, that's not showing up, it'll make that in the views UI turn gray. So you can see uh, which one, which fields are actually displaying it, which ones are being hidden um, at a quick glance. Uh, this one isn't Drupal specific, uh, but from a page performance perspective, uh, download all those uh, web font files. You only need WOFF and EOT files um, and declare them in, in your CSS and send them off from the same origin as all the other resources that you're sending. If you use Google Web Fonts, uh, it's making a call to a CSS file, which makes a call to additional web font files. So it's this big, long chain. Um, I don't know whether they've made that better, but at least at one time, uh, using Google's own tool will cause a performance hit um, from their performance monitoring uh, suite. So um, also having those files in one place and knowing that they're going to be there, um, maybe you can sleep just a little bit easier at night. Um, the block class module uh, lets you put classes right onto blocks, and views comes out of the box with a CSS class for the view display itself and for um, a whole bunch of different elements, um, rows, uh, fields, the whole deal, and you can specify them. Uh, and by putting classes on things, and especially making reusable classes, um, you're, you're making maintenance easier, and uh, also enforcing a, a, some, some consistency. So if you have a grid of three things in one place, why not be able to reuse that grid of three things on the next view that you make? Um, a lot of people don't like this, but I'm partial to it. I like to nest all of my CSS that's related, um, so the base class and then all of its dependencies. Um, and the very last part of each of those little segments are the media queries that go along with it. And what's great about this is if you um, decide to take out an entire piece of functionality, you know that every piece of CSS that you're taking out is going with it just in that one place. So with the little media queries, um, and the other part of this is uh, it helps you mentally uh, say to yourself, uh, this media query, this um, breakpoint that I'm, I'm setting is a breakpoint for the content rather than a breakpoint for some device. So it makes it a, a truly responsive rather than an adaptive site. So I really like the little media queries. And um, from testing, um, from a blog post that I read about testing, um, it doesn't make a difference whether you use one big media query or a whole bunch of little ones. Uh, so views comes out of the box with first and last, uh, and a lot of starter themes. I, I believe Zen um, comes with uh, first and last for blocks as well. So each region would have a first and a last in it. Uh, if your theme doesn't come with that out of the box, it's something that you can kind of unabashedly steal from, from Zen. And that can be really helpful, for instance, um, uh, when you're doing something of a column or layout. So the last block in something would have a uh, different margin than uh, the middle ones. Uh, there's really no reason not to run Coder, especially from that pride perspective, from that uh, not wanting to get up, get beaten up by the next guy perspective. Uh, uh, and uh, at the end of it, you'll have like you kind of learn something new every time that you run coder, especially if you run coder tough love. Um, 
because it doesn't let you get away with very much. And so it's a good way to pick up on the coding standards and fixing things helps you learn to enforce the coding standards. And then um, uh, the API docs, the, uh, um, the documentation team for Drupal.org in general write some really great stuff. Um, when you go to the API docs especially, uh, seeing what the function arguments are for hooks, um, seeing which of them is passed by reference, um, and seeing whether or not there's a return value, and if there is, um, what it, what's expected. Um, if you kind of take a look at that and do the legwork ahead of time, um, it could save you some uh, debugging trouble later. So uh, those are all the do's. Uh, nothing really jumped to mind as I was talking, but uh, following that, those sort of procedures, uh, whether in the context of trying to make a site in 23 hours or whether trying to uh, build a giant project for a multinational corporation over the course of many weeks, uh, these sort of tips can uh, come in handy for that. So uh, thank you very much for listening to me. I hope I didn't bore you too much. And uh, thanks again. Brad, there's so much, <clears throat> so many valuable tips, so much information. Uh, I think, um, frankly, we need to maybe write down a summary of some of those. It was really, really good. Thank you so much. It's um, nice to see uh, again, and it proves itself every time, right? The um, how our community is, uh, a com you know, groups of dedicated professionals who figure out all the tough problems. And the first thing that we want to do is like, hey, I solved this so that you never have to deal with it again, you know? And it's, uh, it's very generous of you to share all this stuff with us. So thank you for that. Awesome. Thanks for having um, me. Yeah, so, so share, your, share your camera now so we can get one more look at you. And then, uh, let me see. If I can. So this might get tacked onto the back of the podcast as well. Hey, there you are. There I am. <laughs> Great. Hey, so thanks for taking the time to put all that together. It's really, really valuable. Um, I am looking forward to putting this together for the Acquia podcast and for Ant Jam's virtual Drupal camp. Uh, bits and pieces of this will be on acquia.com slash podcasts for you to find. Uh, so if you're listening to the audio only version, come and see the text and the slides and the video and all that good stuff. And um, any... Uh, Anything else you want to add from uh, near Detroit there, Brad? I just appreciate the invitation. It was good talking to you. I uh, hope you have a great day. You too. Hey, thanks. Take care. And uh, see you at uh, something soon, I hope, a Drupal camp or something cool. Excellent.